certain. I've become too much the Fremen and the Reverend Mother. I need a time of peace and stillness in which to think. That you shall have, Paul said, and anything else that Gurney or I can give you. Jessica nodded, feeling suddenly old and tired. She looked at Chani. And for the royal concubine? No title for me, Chani whispered. Nothing, I beg of you. Paul stared down into her eyes, remembering her suddenly as she had stood once with little Leto in her arms, their child now dead in this violence. I swear to you now, he whispered, that you'll need no title. That woman over there will be my wife, and you but a concubine, because this is a political thing, and we must weld peace out of this moment, enlist the great houses of the Lancerat. We must obey the forms, yet that princess shall have no more of me than my name. No child of mine, nor touch, nor softness of glance, nor instant of desire. So you say now, Johnny said. She glanced across the room at the tall princess. Do you know so little of my son? Jessica whispered. See that princess standing there so haughty and confident. They say she has pretensions of a literary nature. Let us hope she finds solace in such things. She'll have little else. A bitter laugh escaped Jessica. Think on it, Johnny. That princess will have the name. Yet she'll live as less than a concubine. Never to know a moment of tenderness from the man to whom she's bound. While we, Chani, we who carry the name of concubine, history will call us wives. The End You've been listening to Dune by Frank Herbert, narrated by George Guidel, with Davina Porter as Princess Irulan. From a very young age, Frank Herbert knew he wanted to be a writer. Before devoting his full attention to his novels, he spent some thirty years as a newspaper editor and reporter in various locales on the West Coast. He continued in this profession even after the success of Dune in 1965. In addition, Frank Herbert also engaged in study and special research into psychology, arid lands, photography, ecology, alternative energies, and education. He is the author of over 20 books in addition to the Dune series. He died in 1986. Recorded Books would like to thank his son Brian Herbert for his assistance with the pronunciations in this book. The following are three appendices included by Frank Herbert on the ecology and religion of Dune and the motives of the Bene Gesserit. Appendix 1 The Ecology of Dune Beyond a critical point within a finite space, freedom diminishes as numbers increase. This is as true of humans in the finite space of a planetary ecosystem as it is of gas molecules in a sealed flask. The human question is not how many can possibly survive within the system, but what kind of existence is possible for those who do survive. Pardot Kynes, First Planetologist of Arrakis. The effect of Arrakis on the mind of the newcomer usually is that of overpowering barren land. The stranger might think nothing could live or grow in the open here, that this was the true wasteland that had never been fertile and never would be. To Pardot Kynes, the planet was merely an expression of energy, a machine being driven by its sun. What it needed was reshaping to fit it to man's needs. His mind went directly to the free-moving human population, the Fremen. What a challenge! What a tool they could be! 
Fremen, an ecological and geological force of almost unlimited potential. A direct and simple man in many ways, Pardot Kynes. One must evade Harkonnen restrictions? Excellent. Then one marries a Fremen woman. When she gives you a Fremen son, you begin with him, with Liet Kynes and the other children, teaching them ecological literacy, creating a new language with symbols that arm the mind to manipulate an entire landscape, its climate, seasonal limits, and finally to break through all ideas of force into the dazzling awareness of order. There's an internally recognized beauty of motion and balance on any man-healthy planet, Kind said. You see in this beauty a dynamic, stabilizing effect essential to all life. Its aim is simple, to maintain and produce coordinated patterns of greater and greater diversity. Life improves the closed system's capacity to sustain life. Life, all life, is in the service of life. Necessary nutrients are made available to life by life in greater and greater richness as the diversity of life increases. The entire landscape comes alive, filled with relationships and relationships within relationships. This was Pardot Kynes lecturing to a Siech Warren class. Before the lectures, though, he had to convince the Fremen. To understand how this came about, you must first understand the enormous single-mindedness, the innocence with which he approached any problem. He was not naive. He merely permitted himself no distractions. He was exploring the Arrakis landscape in a one-man ground car one hot afternoon when he stumbled onto a deplorably common scene. Six Harkonnen bravos, shielded and fully armed, had trapped three Fremen youths in the open behind the shield wall near the village of Windsack. To Kynes it was a ding-dong battle, more slapstick than real, until he focused on the fact that the Harkonnens intended to kill the Fremen. By this time one of the youths was down with a severed artery, two of the bravos were down as well, but it was still four armed men against two striplings. Kynes wasn't brave. He merely had that single-mindedness and caution. The Harkonnens were killing Fremen. They were destroying the tools with which he intended to remake a planet. He triggered his own shield, waded in, and had two of the Harkonnens dead with a slip tip before they knew anyone was behind them. He dodged a sword thrust from one of the others, slit the man's throat with a neat entresseur, and left the lone remaining bravo to the two Fremen youths, turning his full attention to saving the lad on the ground. And save the lad he did, while the sixth Harkonnen was being dispatched. Now here was a pretty kettle of sand trout. The Fremen didn't know what to make of Kynes. They knew who he was, of course. No man arrived on Arrakis without a full dossier finding its way into the Fremen strongholds. They knew him. He was an imperial servant. But he killed Harkonnens. Adults might have shrugged and, with some regret, sent his shade to join those of the six dead men on the ground. But these Fremen were inexperienced youths, and all they could see was that they owed this imperial servant a mortal obligation. Kynes wound up two days later in a sketch that looked down on Wind Pass. To him it was all very natural. He talked to the Fremen about water, about dunes anchored by grass, about palmeries filled with date palms, about open canats flowing across the desert. He talked and talked and talked. All around him raged a debate that Kynes never saw. What to do with this madman? He knew the location of a major sketch. What to do? What of his words, this mad talk about a paradise on Arrakis? Just talk. He knows too much. But he killed Harkonnens. What of the water burden? When did we owe the Imperium anything? He killed Harkonnens. Anyone can kill Harkonnens. I have done it myself. But what of this talk about the flowering of Arrakis? Very simple. Where is the water for this? He says it is here, and he did save three of ours. He saved three fools who had put themselves in the way of the Harkonnen fist, and he has seen Chris knives. The necessary decision was known for hours before it was voiced. The Tao of a Siech tells its members what they must do. Even the most brutal necessity is known. 
an experienced fighter was sent with a consecrated knife to do the job. Two watermen followed him to get the water from the body. Brutal necessity. It's doubtful that Kynes even focused on his would-be executioner. He was talking to a group that spread around him at a cautious distance. He walked as he talked, a short circle, gesturing. Open water, Kynes said. Walk in the open without still suits. Water for dipping it out of a pond, portugals. The knife man confronted him. Remove yourself, Kynes said, and went on talking about secret wind traps. He brushed past the man. Kynes' back stood open for the ceremonial blow. What went on in that would-be executioner's mind cannot be known now. Did he finally listen to Kynes and believe? Who knows? But what he did is a matter of record. Uliette was his name, older Liette. Uliette walked three paces and deliberately fell on his own knife, thus removing himself. Suicide? Some say Shai Hulud moved him. Talk about omens. From that instant, Kynes had but to point, saying, Go there. Entire Fremen tribes went. Men died, women died, children died. But they went. Kynes returned to his imperial chores, directing the biological testing stations, and now Fremen began to appear among the station personnel. The Fremen looked at each other. They were infiltrating the system, a possibility they'd never considered. Station tools began finding their way into the Sichuarans, especially cutter rays, which were used to dig underground catch basins and hidden wind traps. Water began collecting in the basins. It became apparent to the Fremen that Kynes was not a madman totally, just mad enough to be holy. He was one of the Uma, the Brotherhood of Prophets. The shade of Uliet was advanced to the Sedus, the throng of heavenly judges. Kynes, direct, savagely intent Kynes, knew that highly organized research is guaranteed to produce nothing new. He set up small unit experiments with regular interchange of data for a swift Tansley effect, let each group find its own path. They must accumulate millions of tiny facts. He organized only isolated and rough run-through tests to put their difficulties into perspective. Core samplings were made throughout the bled. Charts were developed on the long drifts of weather that are called climate. He found that in the wide belt contained by the 70-degree lines, north and south, temperatures for thousands of years hadn't gone outside the 254 to 332 degrees absolute range, and that this belt had long growing seasons where temperatures ranged from 284 to 302 degrees absolute the bonanza range for terraform life, once they solved the water problem. When will we solve it? the Fremen asked. When will we see Arrakis as a paradise? In the manner of a teacher answering a child who has asked the sum of two plus two, Kynes told them, from three hundred to five hundred years. A lesser folk might have howled in dismay, but the Fremen had learned patience from men with whips. It was a bit longer than they had anticipated, but they all could see that the blessed day was coming. They tightened their sashes and went back to work. Somehow, the disappointment made the prospect of paradise more real. The concern on Arrakis was not with water, but with moisture. Pets were almost unknown, stock animals rare. Some smugglers employed the domesticated desert ass, the kulan, but the water price was high even when the beasts were fitted with modified still suits. Kynes thought of installing reduction plants to recover water from the hydrogen and oxygen locked in native rock, but the energy cost factor was far too high. The polar caps, disregarding the false sense of water security they gave the pions, held far too small an amount for his project, and he already suspected where the water had to be. There was that consistent increase of moisture at median altitudes and in certain winds. There was that primary clue in the air balance, 23% oxygen, 75.4% nitrogen, and 0.023% carbon dioxide, with the trace gases taking up the rest. There was a rare native root plant, 
that grew above the 2,500 meter level in the northern temperate zone. A tuber two meters long yielded half a liter of water. And there were the terraform desert plants. The tougher ones showed signs of thriving if planted in depressions lined with dew precipitators. Then Kynes saw the salt pan. His thopter, flying between stations far out on the bled, was blown off course by a storm. When the storm passed, there was the pan, a giant oval depression some three hundred kilometers on a long axis, a glaring white surprise in the open desert. Kynes landed, tasted the pan's storm-cleaned surface. Salt. Now he was certain. There had been open water on Arrakis once. He began re-examining the evidence of the dry wells where trickles of water had appeared and vanished, never to return. Kynes set his newly trained Fremen limnologist to work. Their chief clue? Leathery scraps of matter sometimes found with the spice mass after a blow. This had been ascribed to a fictional sand trout in Fremen folk stories. As facts grew into evidence, a creature emerged to explain these leathery scraps, a sand swimmer that blocked off water into fertile pockets within the porous lower strata below the 280-degree absolute line. This water stealer died by the millions in each spice blow. A five-degree change in temperature could kill it. The few survivors entered a semi-dormant cyst hibernation to emerge in six years as small, about three meters long, sandworms. Of these, only a few avoided their larger brothers and pre-spice water pockets to emerge into maturity as the giant Shaihulud. Water is poisonous to Shaihulud, as the Fremen had long known from drowning the rare, stunted worm of the minor erg to produce the awareness-spectrum narcotic they call water of life. The stunted worm is a primitive form of Shaihulud that reaches a length of only about nine meters. Now they had the circular relationship, little maker to pre-spice mass, little maker to Shaihulud, Shaihulud to scatter the spice upon which fed microscopic creatures called sand plankton. The sand plankton, food for Shaihulud, growing, borrowing, becoming little makers. Kynes and his people turned their attention from these great relationships and focused now on microecology. First, the climate. The sand surface often reached temperatures of 344 degrees to 350 degrees, absolute. A foot below ground, it might be 55 degrees cooler. A foot above ground, 25 degrees cooler. Leaves or black shade could provide another 18 degrees of cooling. Next, the nutrients. Sand of Arrakis is mostly a product of worm digestion. Dust, the truly omnipresent problem there, is produced by the constant surface creep, the saltation movement of sand. Coarse grains are found on the downwind sides of dunes. The windward side is packed smooth and hard. Old dunes are yellow, oxidized. Young dunes are the color of the parent rock, usually gray. Downwind sides of old dunes provided the first plantation areas. The Fremen aimed first for a cycle of poverty grass with peat-like hair cilia to intertwine, mat, and fix the dunes by depriving the wind of its big weapon, movable grains. Adaptive zones were laid out in the deep south far from Harkonnen watchers. The mutated poverty grasses were planted first along the downwind, slip face of the chosen dunes that stood across the path of the prevailing westerlies. With the downwind face anchored, the windward face grew higher and higher, and the grass was moved to keep pace. Giant sifts, long dunes with sinuous crest, of more than 1,500 meters height were produced this way. When barrier dunes reached sufficient height, the windward faces were planted with tougher sword grasses, each structure on a base about six times as thick as its height was anchored, fixed. Now they came in with deeper plantings, ephemerals, kinopods, pigweeds, and amaranth to begin. Then scotch broom, low lupine, vine eucalyptus, the type adapted for Caladan's northern reaches, dwarf tamarisk, shore pine. Then the true desert growths, candalila, saguaro, and bisnaga, the barrel cactus. 
Where it would grow, they introduced camel sage, union grass, gobi feather grass, wild alfalfa, burrow bush, sand verbena, evening primrose, incense bush, smoke tree, creosote bush. They turned then to the necessary animal life, burrowing creatures to open the soil and aerate it, kit fox, kangaroo mouse, desert hare, sand terrapin, and the predators to keep them in check, desert hawk, dwarf owl, eagle and desert owl, and insects to fill the niches these couldn't reach, scorpion, centipede, trapdoor spider, the biting wasp and the worm fly, and the desert bat to keep watch on these. Now came the crucial test. Date palms, cotton, melons, coffee, medicinals, more than two hundred selected food plant types to test and adapt. The thing the ecologically illiterate don't realize about an ecosystem, Kind said, is that it's a system, a system. A system maintains a certain fluid stability that can be destroyed by a misstep in just one niche. A system has order, a flowing from point to point. If something dams that flow, order collapses. The untrained might miss that collapse until it was too late. That's why the highest function of ecology is the understanding of consequences. Had they achieved a system? Kynes and his people watched and waited. The Fremen now knew what he meant by an open-end prediction to five hundred years. A report came up from the palmeries. At the desert edge of the plantings, the sand plankton is being poisoned through interaction with the new forms of life. The reason? Protein incompatibility. Poisonous water was forming there which the Arrakis life would not touch. A barren zone surrounded the plantings and even Shai Hulud would not invade it. Kynes went down to the palmeries himself, a twenty-thumper trip in a palanquin like a wounded man or reverend mother because he never became a sand rider. He tested the barren zone, it stank to heaven, and came up with a bonus, a gift from Arrakis. The addition of sulfur and fixed nitrogen converted the barren zone to a rich plant bed for terraform life. The plantings could be advanced at will. Does this change the timing? the Fremen asked. Kynes went back to his planetary formulae. Wind trap figures were fairly secure by then. He was generous with his allowances, knowing he couldn't draw neat lines around ecological problems. A certain amount of plant cover had to be set aside to hold dunes in place, a certain amount for foodstuffs, both human and animal, a certain amount to lock moisture in root systems and to feed water out into surrounding parched areas. They'd mapped the roving cold spots on the open bled by this time. These had to be figured into the formulae. Even Shai Hulud had a place in the charts. He must never be destroyed, else spice wealth would end. But his inner digestive factory, with its enormous concentrations of aldehydes and acids, was a giant source of oxygen. A medium worm, about 200 meters long, discharged into the atmosphere as much oxygen as 10 square kilometers of green-growing photosynthesis surface. He had the guilt to consider. The spice bribed to the guild for preventing weather satellites and other watchers in the skies of Arrakis already had reached major proportions. Nor could the Fremen be ignored, especially the Fremen with their wind traps and irregular land holdings organized around water supply. The Fremen with their new ecological literacy and their dream of cycling vast areas of Arrakis through a prairie phase into forest cover. From the charts emerged a figure. Kynes reported it. Three percent. If they could get 3% of the green plant element on Arrakis involved in forming carbon compounds, they'd have their self-sustaining cycle. But how long, the Fremen demanded. Oh, that, about 350 years. So it was true, as this Uma had said in the beginning, the thing would not come in the lifetime of any man now living, nor in the lifetime of their grandchildren eight times removed, but it would come. The work continued, building, planting, digging, training the children. Then Kynes the Uma was killed in the cave-in at Plaster Basin. By this time his son Liet Kynes was nineteen, a full Fremen and sand rider who had killed more than a hundred Harkonnens. The imperial appointment for which the elder Kynes already had applied in the name of his son was delivered as a matter of course. The rigid class structure of the Faufreluches had its well-ordered purpose here. The son had been trained to follow the father. 
The course had been set by this time. The ecological Fremen were aimed along their way. Liet Kynes had only to watch and nudge and spy upon the Harkonnens. Until the day his planet was afflicted by a hero. Appendix 2 The Religion of Dune Before the coming of Muad'Dib, the Fremen of Arrakis practiced a religion whose roots in the Maometh Sari are there for any scholar to see. Many have traced the extensive borrowings from other religions. The most common example is the Hymn to Water, a direct copy from the Orange Catholic Liturgical Manual, calling for rain clouds which Arrakis had never seen. But there are more profound points of accord between the Kitab al-Ibar of the Fremen and the teachings of Bible, Ilm, and Fiqh. Any comparison of the religious beliefs dominant in the Imperium up to the time of Muad'Dib must start with the major forces which shaped those beliefs. 1. The followers of the fourteen sages, whose book was the Orange Catholic Bible and whose views are expressed in the commentaries and other literature produced by the Commission of Ecumenical Translators, CET. 2. The Bene Gesserit, who privately denied they were a religious order, but who operated behind an almost impenetrable screen of ritual mysticism, and whose training, whose symbolism, organization, and internal teaching methods were almost wholly religious. 3. The agnostic ruling class, including the Guild, for whom religion was a kind of puppet show to amuse the populace and keep it docile and who believed essentially that all phenomena, even religious phenomena, could be reduced to mechanical explanations. 4. The so-called ancient teachings, including those preserved by the Zen Sunni wanderers from the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Islamic movements, the Nava Christianity of Chusuk, the Buddhist-Islamic variants of the types dominant at Lankivail and Sikun, the blend books of the Mahayana Lankavatara, the Zen Hegiganshu of three Delta Pavonis, the Torah and Talmudic Zabur surviving on Salusa Secundus, the pervasive Obea ritual, the Muat Quran with its pure ilm and fiqh preserved among the Pundi rice farmers of Kaladan, the Hindu outcroppings found all through the universe in little pockets of insulated pions, and finally the Butlerian Jihad. There is a fifth force which shaped religious belief, but its effect is so universal and profound that it deserves to stand alone. This is, of course, space travel. And in any discussion of religion, it deserves to be written in capitals. Space travel. Mankind's movement through deep space placed a unique stamp on religion during the 110 centuries that preceded the Butlerian Jihad. To begin with, early space travel, although widespread, was largely unregulated, slow, and uncertain. And before the guild monopoly was accomplished by a hodgepodge of methods. The first space experiences, poorly communicated and subject to extreme distortion, were a wild inducement to mystical speculation. Immediately, space gave a different flavor and sense to ideas of creation. That difference is seen even in the highest religious achievements of the period. All through religion, the feeling of the sacred was touched by anarchy from the outer dark. It was as though Jupiter, in all his descendant forms, retreated into the maternal darkness to be superseded by a female imminence filled with ambiguity and with a face of many terrors. The ancient formulae intertwined, tangled together as they were fitted to the needs of new conquests and new heraldic symbols. It was a time of struggle between beast demons on the one side and the old prayers and invocations on the other. There was never a clear decision. During this period it was said that Genesis was reinterpreted, permitting God to say, Increase and multiply, and fill the universe, and subdue it, and rule over all manner of strange beasts and living creatures in the infinite airs, on the infinite earths, and beneath them. It was a time of sorceresses whose powers were real. The measure of them is seen in the fact that they never boasted how they grasped the firebrand. 
Then came the Butlerian Jihad. Two generations of chaos. The god of machine logic was overthrown among the masses, and a new concept was raised. Man may not be replaced. Those two generations of violence were a thalamic pause for all humankind. Men looked at their gods and their rituals and saw that both were filled with that most terrible of all equations, fear over ambition. Hesitantly, the leaders of religions whose followers had spilled the blood of billions began meeting to exchange views. It was a move encouraged by the Spacing Guild, which was beginning to build its monopoly over all interstellar travel, and by the Bene Gesserit, who were banding the sorceresses. Out of those first ecumenical meetings came two major developments. One, the realization that all religions had at least one common commandment, Thou shalt not disfigure the soul. Two, the commission of ecumenical translators. CET convened on a neutral island of old earth, spawning ground of the mother religions. They met in the common belief that there exists a divine essence in the universe. Every faith with more than a million followers were represented, and they reached a surprisingly immediate agreement on the statement of their common goal. We are here to remove a primary weapon from the hands of disputant religions. That weapon, the claim to possession of the one and only revelation. Jubilation at this sign of profound accord proved premature. For more than a standard year, that statement was the only announcement from CET. Men spoke bitterly of the delay. Troubadours composed witty, biting songs about the 121 old cranks, as the CET delegates came to be called. The name arose from a ribald joke which played on the CET initials and called the delegates Cranks Effing Turners. One of the songs, Brown Repose, has undergone periodic revival and is popular even today. Consider Lays, Brown Repose, and... The tragedy in all of those cranks, all those cranks, so lays, so lays through all your days, time has told for milord sandwich. Occasional rumors leaked out of the CET sessions. It was said they were comparing texts, and irresponsibly the texts were named. Such rumors inevitably provoked anti-ecumenism riots, and, of course, inspired new witticisms. Two years passed. Three years. The commissioners, nine of their original number having died and been replaced, paused to observe formal installation of the replacements and announced they were laboring to produce one book weeding out all the pathological symptoms of the religious past. We are producing an instrument of love to be played in all ways, they said. Many consider it odd that this statement provoked the worst outbreaks of violence against ecumenism. Twenty delegates were recalled by their congregations. One committed suicide by stealing a space frigate and diving it into the sun. Historians estimate the riots took 80 million lives. That works out to about 6,000 for each world then in the Lanzarote League. Considering the unrest of the time, this may not be an excessive estimate, although any pretense to real accuracy in the figure must be just that, pretense. Communication between worlds was at one of its lowest ebbs. The troubadours, quite naturally, had a field day. A popular musical comedy of the period had one of the CET delegates sitting on a white sand beach beneath a palm tree, singing, For God, woman, and the splendor of love... We dally here sans fears or cares. Troubadour, troubadour, sing another melody for God, woman, and the splendor of love. Riots and comedy are but symptoms of the times, profoundly revealing. They betray the psychological tone, the deep uncertainties, and the striving for something better, plus the fear that nothing would come of it all. The major dams against anarchy in these times were the Embryo Guild, the Bene Gesserit and the Lanzarad, which continued its 2,000-year record of meeting in spite of the severest obstacles. The Guild's part appears clear. They gave free transport for all Lanzarad and CET business. The Bene Gesserit role is more obscure. 
Certainly this is the time in which they consolidated their hold upon the sorceresses, explored the subtle narcotics, developed prana bindu training, and conceived the missionaria protectiva, that black arm of superstition. But it is also the period that saw the composing of the litany against fear, and the assembly of the Azhar book, that bibliographic marvel that preserves the great secrets of the most ancient faiths. Ingsley's comment is perhaps the only one possible. Those were times of deep paradox. For almost seven years, then, C.E.T. labored. And as their seventh anniversary approached, they prepared the human universe for a momentous announcement. On that seventh anniversary, they unveiled the Orange Catholic Bible. Here is a work with dignity and meaning, they said. Here is a way to make humanity aware of itself as a total creation of God. The men of C.E.T. were likened to archaeologists of ideas, inspired by God in the grandeur of rediscovery. It was said they had brought to light the vitality of great ideals overlaid by the deposits of centuries, that they had sharpened the moral imperatives that come out of a religious conscience. With the O.C. Bible, C.E.T. presented the liturgical manual and the commentaries, in many respects a more remarkable work, not only because of its brevity, less than half the size of the O.C. Bible, but also because of its candor and blend of self-pity and self-righteousness. The beginning is an obvious appeal to the agnostic rulers. Men, finding no answers to the Sunan, the ten thousand religious questions from the Sharia, now apply their own reasoning. All men seek to be enlightened. Religion is but the most ancient and honorable way in which men have striven to make sense out of God's universe. Scientists seek the lawfulness of events. It is the task of religion to fit man into this lawfulness. In their conclusion, though, the commentaries set a harsh tone that very likely foretold their fate. Much that was called religion has carried an unconscious attitude of hostility toward life. True religion must teach that life is filled with joys pleasing to the eye of God, that knowledge without action is empty. All men must see that the teaching of religion by rules and rote is largely a hoax. The proper teaching is recognized with ease. You can know it without fail because it awakens within you that sensation which tells you this is something you've always known. There was an odd sense of calm as the presses and sugar wire imprinters rolled and the O.C. Bible spread out through the worlds. Some interpreted this as a sign from God, an omen of unity. But even the C.E.T. delegates betrayed the fiction of that calm as they returned to their respective congregations. Eighteen of them were lynched within two months. Fifty-three recanted within the year. The O.C. Bible was denounced as a work produced by the hubris of reason. It was said that its pages were filled with a seductive interest in logic. Revisions that catered to popular bigotry began appearing. These revisions leaned on accepted symbolisms, cross, crescent, feather rattle, the twelve saints, the thin Buddha, and the like and it soon became apparent that the ancient superstitions and beliefs had not been absorbed by the new ecumenism. Halloway's label for C.E.T.'s seven-year effort, galactophasic determinism, was snapped up by eager billions who interpreted the initials G.D. as God damned. C.E.T. chairman Ture Bomoko, a ulema of the Senzunis and one of the fourteen delegates who never recanted, the fourteen sages of popular history, appeared to admit finally the C.E.T. had erred. We shouldn't have tried to create new symbols, he said. We should have realized we weren't supposed to introduce uncertainties into accepted belief, that we weren't supposed to stir up curiosity about God. We are daily confronted by the terrifying instability of all things human, yet we permit our religions to grow more rigid and controlled, more conforming and oppressive. What is this shadow across the highway of divine command? It is a warning that institutions endure, that symbols endure when their meaning is lost, that there is no summa of all attainable knowledge. 
The bitter double edge in this admission did not escape Bomoko's critics, and he was forced soon afterward to flee into exile, his life dependent upon the guild's pledge of secrecy. He reportedly died on Tupile, honored and beloved. His last words, Religion must remain an outlet for people who say to themselves, I am not the kind of person I want to be. It must never sink into an assemblage of the self-satisfied. It is pleasant to think that Bomoko understood the prophecy in his words, Institutions endure. Ninety generations later, the O.C. Bible and the commentaries permeated the religious universe. When Paul Muad'Dib stood with his right hand on the rock shrine enclosing his father's skull, the right hand of the blessed, not the left hand of the damned, he quoted word for word from Bomoko's legacy. You who have defeated us say to yourselves that Babylon is fallen and its works have been overturned. I say to you still that man remains on trial, each man in his own dock. Each man is a little war. The Fremen said of Muad'Dib that he was like Abu Zide, whose frigate defied the guild and rode one day there and back. There, used in this way, translates directly from the Fremen mythology as the land of the Rue spirit, the Alam al-Mithal, where all limitations are removed. The parallel between this and the Kwisatz Haderach is readily seen. The Kwisatz Haderach that the sisterhood sought through its breeding program was interpreted as the shortening of the way, or the one who can be two places simultaneously. But both of these interpretations can be shown to stem directly from the commentaries. When law and religious duty are one, your selfdom encloses the universe. Of himself, Muad'Dib said, I am a net in the sea of time, free to sweep future and past. I am a moving membrane from whom no possibility can escape. These thoughts are all one and the same, and they hearken to 22 Kalima in the O.C. Bible, where it says, Whether a thought is spoken or not, it is a real thing, and has powers of reality. It is when we get into Muad'Dib's own commentaries in The Pillars of the Universe, as interpreted by his holy men, the Kizara Tafwid, that we see his real debt to C.E.T. and Fremen Zen Sunni. Muad'Dib. Law and duty are one, so be it. But remember these limitations. Thus are you never fully self-conscious. Thus do you remain immersed in the communal Tao. Thus are you always less than an individual. O.C. Bible, Identical Wording, 61 Revelations Muad'Dib Religion often partakes of the myth of progress that shields us from the terrors of an uncertain future. C.E.T. Commentaries Identical Wording The Azhar Book traces this statement to the first-century religious writer, Neshu, through a paraphrase. Muad'Dib, if a child, an untrained person, an ignorant person, or an insane person incites trouble, it is the fault of authority for not predicting and preventing that trouble. O.C. Bible, any sin can be ascribed, at least in part, to a natural bad tendency that is an extenuating circumstance acceptable to God. The Azhar book traces this to the ancient Semitic Torah. Muad'Dib, reach forth thy hand and eat what God has provided thee, and when thou art replenished, praise the Lord. O.C. Bible, a paraphrase with identical meaning. The Azhar book traces this in slightly different form to first Islam. Muad'Dib, kindness is the beginning of cruelty. Fremen Kitab al-Ibar, the weight of a kindly God is a fearful thing. Did not God give us the burning sun, Allah? Did not God give us the mothers of moisture, reverend mothers? Did not God give us shaitan, iblis, Satan? From shaitan did we not get the hurtfulness of speed? This is the source of the Fremen saying, Speed comes from shaitan. Consider, for every one hundred calories of heat generated by exercise, speed the body evaporates about six ounces of perspiration. 
The Fremen word for perspiration is baka, or tears, and in one pronunciation translates the life essence that shaitan squeezes from your soul. Muad'Dib's arrival is called religiously timely by Cunniwell, but timing had little to do with it. As Muad'Dib himself said, I am here, so... It is, however, vital to an understanding of Muad'Dib's religious impact that you never lose sight of one fact. The Fremen were a desert people whose entire ancestry was accustomed to hostile landscapes. Mysticism isn't difficult when you survive each second by surmounting open hostility. You are there. So. With such a tradition, suffering is accepted, perhaps as unconscious punishment, but accepted. And it's well to note that Fremen ritual gives almost complete freedom from guilt feelings. This isn't necessarily because their law and religion were identical, making disobedience a sin. It's likely closer to the mark to say they cleansed themselves of guilt easily because their everyday existence required brutal judgments, often deadly, which in a softer land would burden men with unbearable guilt. This is likely one of the roots of Fremen emphasis on superstition, disregarding the Missionaria Protectiva's ministrations. What matter that whistling sands are an omen? What matter that you must make the sign of the fist when first you see first moon? A man's flesh is his own, and his water belongs to the tribe, and the mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. Omens help you remember this. And because you are here... Because you have the religion, victory cannot evade you in the end. As the Bene Gesserit taught for centuries, long before they ran afoul of the Fremen, when religion and politics ride the same cart, when that cart is driven by a living holy man, Baraka, nothing can stand in their path. Appendix 3 Report on Bene Gesserit Motives and Purposes. Here follows an excerpt from the Summa prepared by her own agents at the request of the Lady Jessica immediately after the Arrakis affair. The candor of this report amplifies its value far beyond the ordinary. Because the Bene Gesserit operated for centuries behind the blind of a semi-mystic school while carrying on their selective breeding program among humans, we tend to award them with more status than they appear to deserve. Analysis of their trial of fact on the Arrakis affair betrays the school's profound ignorance of its own role. It may be argued that the Bene Gesserit could examine only such facts as were available to them and had no direct access to the person of the prophet Moadib. But the school had surmounted greater obstacles, and its error here goes deeper. The Bene Gesserit program had as its target the breeding of a person they labeled Kwisatz Haderach, a term signifying one who can be many places at once. In simpler terms, what they sought was a human with mental powers permitting him to understand and use higher-order dimensions. They were breeding for a super mentat, a human computer with some of the prescient abilities found in guild navigators. Now, attend these facts carefully. Muad'Dib, born Paul Atreides, was the son of the Duke Leto, a man whose bloodline had been watched carefully for more than a thousand years. The prophet's mother, Lady Jessica, was a natural daughter of the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, and carried gene markers whose supreme importance to the breeding program was known for almost two thousand years. She was a Bene Gesserit bred and trained, and should have been a willing tool of the project. The Lady Jessica was ordered to produce an Atreides daughter. The plan was to inbreed this daughter with Fade Rautha Harkonnen, a nephew of the Baron Vladimir, with the high probability of a Kwisatz Haderach from that union. Instead, for reasons she confesses have never been completely clear to her, the concubine Lady Jessica defied her orders and bore a son. This alone should have alerted the Bene Gesserit to the possibility that a wild variable had entered their scheme. But there were other far more important indications that they virtually ignored. 1. As a youth, 
Paul Atreides showed ability to predict the future. He was known to have had prescient visions that were accurate, penetrating, and defied four-dimensional explanation. Two, the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam, Bene Gesserit Proctor, who tested Paul's humanity when he was fifteen, deposes that he surmounted more agony in the test than any other human of record. Yet she failed to make special note of this in her report. Three, when family Atreides moved to the planet Arrakis, the Fremen population there hailed the young Paul as a prophet, the voice from the outer world. The Bene Gesserit were well aware that the rigors of such a planet as Arrakis with its totality of desert landscape, its absolute lack of open water, its emphasis on the most primitive necessities for survival, inevitably produces a higher proportion of sensitives. Yet this Fremen reaction, and the obvious element of the Arakeen diet high in spice, were glossed over by Bene Gesserit observers. 4. When the Harkonnens and the soldier fanatics of the Padishah Emperor reoccupied Arrakis, killing Paul's father and most of the Atreides' troops, Paul and his mother disappeared. But almost immediately there were reports of a new religious leader among the Fremen, a man called Muad'Dib, who again was hailed as the voice from the outer world. The reports stated clearly that he was accompanied by a new reverend mother of the Sayadina rite, who is the woman who bore him. Records available to the Bene Gesserit stated in plain terms that the Fremen legends of the prophet contained these words, He shall be born of a Bene Gesserit witch. It may be argued here that the Bene Gesserit sent their missionary a protectiva unto Arrakis centuries earlier to implant something like this legend as safeguard should any members of the school be trapped there and require sanctuary, and that this legend of the voice from the outer world was properly to be ignored because it appeared to be the standard Bene Gesserit ruse. But this would be true only if you granted that the Bene Gesserit were correct in ignoring the other clues about Paul Moadib. 5. When the Arrakis affair boiled up, the Spacing Guild made overtures to the Bene Gesserit. The Guild hinted that its navigators, who used the spice drug of Arrakis to produce the limited prescience necessary for guiding spaceships through the void, were bothered about the future or saw problems on the horizon. This could only mean they saw a nexus, a meeting place of countless delicate decisions beyond which the path was hidden from the prescient eye. This was a clear indication that some agency was interfering with higher order dimensions. A few of the Bene Gesserit had long been aware that the Guild could not interfere directly with the vital spice source because Guild navigators already were dealing in their own inept way with higher order dimensions at least to the point where they recognized that the slightest misstep they made on Arrakis could be catastrophic. It was a known fact that guild navigators could predict no way to take control of the spice without producing just such a nexus. The obvious conclusion was that someone of higher order powers was taking control of the spice source, yet the Bene Gesserit missed this point entirely. In the face of these facts, one is led to the inescapable conclusion that the inefficient Bene Gesserit behavior in this affair was a product of an even higher plan, of which they were completely unaware. This ends the final appendix, bringing to an end this recording of Dune.